everyone, and welcome to Diversity Matters, where we explore all things diversity, equity, and inclusion related. I'm your host, Oscar Holmes IV, and I'm so excited to welcome Dr. Courtney Clooney to the guest chair today as we talk about a topic that is getting more and more attention in the mainstream media today, code switching. Courtney is an assistant professor of organizational behavior in the School of Industrial and Labor Relations at Cornell University. Her research examines how practices and norms in organizational contexts shape marginalized groups' experiences and perpetuate inequitable structures, and she has published numerous articles and book chapters in academic and practitioner outlets on diversity, inclusion, race, and gender at work. Dr. Courtney McClooney, welcome to Diversity Matters. Thank you so much for having me, Dr. Holmes. We'll be back after a quick word from our sponsors. The PhD project aims to increase workplace diversity by starting at the source of tomorrow's workforce, the college campus. In college, professors are the main role models and mentors for students. But until 1994, almost no business professors were African American, Hispanic American, or Native American. The PhD project is changing all that. It has encouraged more than 1,000 underrepresented minorities to earn a doctoral degree. That's the ticket qualifying them to become business professors. As faculty, they are encouraging and assisting countless young minority students nationwide to pursue business careers. The model is simple. Diversify the head of the classroom and you'll diversify the pool of students who'll be tomorrow's business leaders. It's working. 90% of PhD project participants complete the challenging five-year path to a business doctorate. And 97% of those have become professors. Corporate America supports the PhD project. It was founded by KPMG Foundation and City, along with AACSB International and the Graduate Management Admission Council. Many top companies fund the project. The PhD project is changing the face of business academe. Interested in becoming a professor? Visit us online to apply to attend our annual conference. Want to learn how the project can help its funders recruit minority talent on campus? Visit our website. So I have known Courtney ever since she was a PhD student at the University of Michigan. So she's like a little sister to me. (laughs) And as a big brother, I've just been so proud of you, of all your success in academia. But moreover, I've been proud of the contributions that you're making to the DEI field. So when I decided I wanted to do an episode on code switching, I jumped at asking you to be my guest because you're a rising star and I wanted to get you while I still could. So I could say I knew you when. But in all seriousness, I love the work that you're doing and believe your voice should be amplified so that it can help even more people. So Courtney, let's get started. Who is Courtney McClooney beyond what people might read from your professional bio? Who is she? Yeah, if you were to ask my parents that, they would remind me that as a child, when I did make believe, I would pretend that I was a teacher in front of my stuffed animals. I had a little chalkboard in my room and and I would be teaching them random subjects or topics. I'm sure it had something to do with a children's book I was reading at the time. So this idea of being this curious person who is looking and seeking knowledge and wanting to share it with others, I think is a big part of how I see myself. Also someone who really likes to read. I have explored so many genres. I really enjoy um, historical fiction, some sci-fi work in their fantasy novels. And I think all of those are a big part of what it means to be a researcher too. Like you have to have some sort of curiosity. You have to want to share knowledge and and create knowledge too and build on conversation. And I love engaging with the public. I think that's a part of our job that is not as um, explicit or something people may not know whenever they think, what does a professor do? (laughs) Um, But I, I really love things like this, like having open conversations about our work and the ways that it's shaping the world around us. I know that's still kind of related to my professional background, but I really do think that's a core part of who I am. No, I totally agree. You talked about your broad range of interests in terms of reading. So who are some of your favorite authors? You know, anything interesting you're reading now? 
I will say when the pandemic started, I opted to read something that was very lighthearted and things that would not necessarily take me away. I like being very present in moments of grief and trauma and fights for progress and racial justice and in particular. So I didn't want something that would take me away from this moment, but I did want something to remind me of the constant feeling of joy and pain that coexist in the lives of so many marginalized people. So I opted to read some romance novels, some, his, some fictional romance novels. And one of my favorite authors right now is Jasmine Gilroy. She is a Black woman. And that feel, that genre of romance novels tends to be dominated by a lot of white women. So I appreciate hearing her voice. It's so normative to have these Black and Latina women and men falling in love with each other and not needing any sort of traumatic background in order to you know, experience something as human as love and compassion. So I, I'm really enjoying her books. I think the sixth one is coming out this summer, and I have it already ordered. <laughs> <laughs> excellent. Excellent. Shout out to Jasmine. Love her work. Thank yes. you for introducing her work to all of our Diversity Matters listeners. So I love the fact that, and you know, I haven't read her work, but I love the fact that she focuses on the joy about being a person of color because, you know, oftentimes we do hear about all the negative things, but, you know, it's always important to remind people that there's so much joy about being who you are, being a part of the group that we are part of, that I don't think is shared nearly enough. And, you know, so some people use the phrase, oh my God, it's so stressful being a Black person in America, right? And, and so we try to shift the language to say, it's not stressful. Like, racism is stressful. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's not b- about being Black. <laughs> Because being Black is such a joy, I know, to to many of us. So I'm I'm glad that you shared that with us because I'm not a romance novel reader, but I love hearing about, you know, people doing great things in a lot of different genres. So shout out Jasmine once again. So you've done a lot of research in diverse equity and inclusion. And and one of the topics that we're going to talk about today and, and the one that has, you know, gained some widespread media attention is the code switching. Tell us, like, what made you interested in this research area? And for people who may not be in in the academics, right, in academia, because this is a a function of the podcast to make this accessible to the general public. So tell us what code switching is to you and and what made you interested in this topic. Yes. So our academic operationalization of the term code switching is really trying to understand how and why people are shifting their behavior, their appearance, their manner of speech, how it is that they present themselves in various social contexts. What is the motivation behind it? And to what end are people engaging in these these shifting behaviors? The term itself actually comes from linguistic studies and it literally meant the switching between languages. But over time, as social scientists started to explore a lot of the behaviors that anthropologists were noticing amongst people in different groups around the world, they noticed that it was more than just language switching. It was demeanor. It was it was your social interactions. And some of that indicated a, some sort of different relationship that I have to someone in my family, for instance, versus someone who I have a more professional relationship with. So what our research is doing is adding in the layer of race on top of these normal ways that all of us shift in society. We don't speak to our parents and grandparents the same way that we speak to our colleagues at work. But the reasons why we don't do that differs greatly depending on if you are a member of a marginalized, oppressed group and and if presenting yourself in a certain way leads to certain consequences that is going to be different for different people. And I think the reason why I got interested in this research is a couple things. I love thinking about how my lived experience and unique lens on the world is important in helping to shape our understanding of diversity, equity, and inclusion in the workplace. Uh, This is one of the reasons why I advocate so strongly for there to be more diversity in the field of academic research, because we're all coming at this from different perspectives. And I firmly remember colloquially hearing the term code switching when I was growing up. We would call it things like, that's your white person voice on the phone, or I have this job interview, let me go straighten my hair. And these behaviors were considered, you know, dimensions of code switching. It was such a big part of how it was socialized and how to interact in in this world. And I noticed that it was also something that a lot of immigrant families into the U.S. were also socialized to do, to lose your accent, to really learn and finesse English, to really embody and embrace what a prototypical American family looks like, dresses like, eats, uh, what are they interested in? And I was at the time at the University of Michigan 
working with a assistant professor there, Dr. Miles Durkee in the psychology department. And he was studying a lot of ways that adolescents were trying to understand and feel authentic in their racial identity. Uh, so what did it mean primarily for Black and Latino youth to identify with their racial group and to feel culturally authentic? And what he found was a lot of Black and Latino students who had interests that were considered non-stereotypical for Black and Latino students, whether that's the type of music you listen to or how you dress, they were accused of acting white, typically from other intra-group peers. And that notion of, of acting white really led us to think about all the different social contexts where people from marginalized groups might shift their behavior to act more white. And I realized that this was more likely to happen in traditional corporate workspaces where the dominant norms uh, around what it means to look and sound professional, the names that we associate with confidence, professionalism, the appearance you know, standards that we associate with confidence and professionalism tend to default to Eurocentric standards of beauty, of speech, of names that are considered white sounding names. So that is really what spurred and motivated that research. And I mentioned some of the behaviors that also comprise code switching as a concept. Right. I think you just gave me an idea for another episode because the whole acting white, you know, conversation, there's a lot of nuance in that conversation. And so I think I want to go a little bit further with you, but I know it may take us off topic, but I need to put a pin in that because that needs to be another episode in itself, acting white. Dr. Miles Beck would be a great like guest speaker to have on that topic. He studied it extensively and over time with the cohort students in Chicago. Thank you. Um, so I think it would be a great contribution. Thank you for that. You know, you co-authored a very influential Harvard Business Review article called The Cost of Code Switching. So tell our listeners about these costs and ways they can kind of mitigate these costs. Yeah, so code switching is one of those catch-22s that I think a lot of marginalized people are going to encounter in the workplace. What we find in our research is that people who are code switching, adjusting their style of speech, their name, their appearance, they're actually perceived as more professional, especially from white observers. And when we think about workplace leadership, I think Goldman Sachs just released their numbers today. The portion of white people in positions of power who make hiring decisions and promotion decisions and board appointee decisions, they are valuing code switching behaviors. And that means this is something that can likely boost the career of people who are coming from marginalized groups. On the other hand, our research also found that people who reported high levels of code switching also reported high levels of burnout, feeling inauthentic and that they are not part of their racial group. And this has lots of downstream consequences. My colleagues and I are actually starting a study right now looking at some of the physiological consequences associated with constantly worrying about not just what you say, but how you're saying it and wanting to make sure that you don't deviate from your code switching persona. Dr. Tira Charles calls it wearing a mask and, and it's, it's quite heavy a load to wear a mask all day in addition to our literal mask that we have to wear. And then for people from marginalized groups, that is going to create a dilemma. So on the one hand, are you willing to sacrifice your mental, physical, and emotional well-being in order to be perceived as professional at work? If you do do these things, some of the costs are you, you may be promoted. You may you know, be perceived as professional, but you're also sacrificing feelings of cultural authenticity and, again, like your well-being. And then if you choose not to do these things and to be authentic, this could compromise your career prospects. Perhaps you will not receive the callback for a job if your resume looks too Black, looks too Asian. Like we, we've seen this with Sonya King's work as well, the white resume phenomena. Uh, so th there are numerous costs on, on either side on whether or not people choose to switch or not. So where do you draw the line, if you can, between what is code switching and what we would call in our field general impression management, right? Because, you know, in most scenarios, wherever we are, we engage in some form of impression management, right, to kind of project some professional image of ourselves. And do you delineate between impression management and code switching? And, and, and if so, can you help us unpack your thoughts around that delineation at all? That's such a good question. I'm going to really try. So like think the way that I have approached impression management in my work is thinking of it as a broad umbrella term that includes lots of different 
types of behaviors, things like identity negotiation, covering, self-presentation, and then I think of code switching as one of many impression management strategies. How I think it slightly differs from something like identity negotiation, let's say. Identity negotiation most often requires an individual to think, to what extent do I want to disclose aspects of my identity that may not be visible to other people? And deciding when and how you're negotiating your identity is slightly different than trying to manage the impression of an identity that people already see. They already see that you're Black. They're wondering, what type of Black person are you? Are you the type that's an exception to the stereotypes I have in my mind? Do you sound a certain way? Do you, you know, are you interested in the things that I'm interested in? Does your hair look like mine? And we know that the more that you can make yourself seem similar to people of another group, there is this phenomenon of of homophily, the similarity attraction paradigm, where people like others who remind them of themselves. So code switching is a mechanism that allows people to start to emulate the norms and behaviors of a group that they are trying to achieve some sort of outcome from, whether it's, I want this other person to feel comfortable in this situation, so I'm going to lower my tone. I'm going to adjust how I'm speaking so that way they do not see me as a threat. Unfortunately, I think this plays out in real life where we see with police encounters, right, where there's a lot of pressure on on mostly Black and Latino and, and Indigenous people to make police officers feel comfortable so that they can survive this encounter. And, and I think a less you know extreme example is um, in the workplace. If we are trying to build a relationship with people who are in positions of power, emulating the things that they're interested in, going to play golf, going to learn how to play golf, right? I think that is a form of code switching. Whereas something like identity negotiation is wondering, when do I disclose that I am a first-generation college student? When do I disclose that I actually identify as as a member of the autism community. And with things like covering, for instance, to what extent do I reveal aspects of myself that that people may not know and how I affiliate myself with different groups? So so that's how I think of and position them along each other. This is just one form of impression management. And unlike some other impression management strategies, code switching can't obscure the fact that you are a member of a marginalized group. It's depending on how you intend to perform and present that identity in a way that is as favorable as possible to the outcomes that you want to achieve. I hope that makes sense. I feel like I deviated. (laughs) That was perfect. That was perfect. I really like that not only did you give us some linguistic examples, right? You gave us some behavioral examples because that golf one, let me tell you. I do not know how to play golf. I've never played golf before, but I have gone over in my mind how many times, you know, should I sign up for these golf clinics, you know, thinking about where I want to go in the future with my career. Like, do I really need to do this? I mean, I know people have friends who play golf and they love it. And so I'm not saying that, you know, it will be a new experience for me and I may not, I mean, I may love it if I try, but it wasn't anything that was genuine, right? In terms of coming from me, like, oh, I always wanted to play golf, right? It was looking in the future from a career perspective and determining, is this something that I feel like I need to be able to do in order to make an impression, a favorable impression upon some, you know, important stakeholders later on in my career. So I think that behavioral example is a great translation uh, for a lot of people to hear because we typically think only about the linguistic examples of code switching. And not to mention golf is one of those high price you know, sports as well. I was going to say, like, I love that you mentioned, I felt pressure, right? It's like code switching. Whenever people say, oh, of course I turn my work self off and on. I was like, but the stakes are different for different groups of people, right? It's not likely that I am related to one of many CEOs in this country. Right? Right, right. I don't have rich uncles to invest in my startup, right? So when we don't have those network ties. What are the various ways that people are trying to build relationships at what cost, right? And, and what I think is more interesting too is we are seeing there is an industry that also encourages code switching. I remember before I started graduate school, I was part of an AmeriCorps program. And there were various nonprofits we were working with. And one of the ones that I remember my colleague worked for, their mission was to take black and brown youth and to help prepare them for the professional world. And they were essentially teaching them how to code switch. This is how you talk. This is what you're interested in. I've seen golf clinics for women, for women of all races, like you need to learn how to play golf. And, and I, I asked myself, like, are we okay with 
creating a whole industry around teaching people how to code switch, how does that continue to normalize white norms, culture, white male norms, I should say, culture and values as the default and as something we should all aspire to? What are we leaving out by continuing to normalize that type of culture and behavior? I just find that so fascinating that we have created a whole system around keeping code switching as the only one of the few pathways that we can actually survive and thrive in this world. You hit the nail on the head with this whole industry, right? And what really rubs me the wrong way is, you know, many of these perhaps good intentional programs and things that come about and it almost like the perception, oh my gosh, these underprivileged kids, they don't have these opportunities. You know, they aren't exposed to these things. And and I'm thinking like, we don't talk about white kids that way, right? Like there's so much Black, Latinx, Indigenous culture that white kids don't get. And we don't say to them, oh my God, they should be exposed to learning how to play space. They should be exposed, right, to, to learning how to dance these wonderful dance styles and all of these different things. But it's ballet that our kids should be exposed to. But, you know, African-American dance styles, white kids shouldn't be exposed to that. And if they're not exposed to that, which many of them aren't authentically exposed, they may see it on TV, they're not looked at as, oh, you missed out so much, you know, opportunity and culture. It always frustrates me, right, when I speak with individuals and, and organizations and, and they have these, quote unquote, you know, lofty, good intentional goals. And then I'm like, we need to change this narrative about, oh, you underprivileged, you know, kid, and you need exposure to all these different things because we have a lot of things within our culture, right, that is really useful and other people can benefit from it as well. Exactly. And they know that they can benefit from it because we see the appropriation of our culture being monetized and marketed to the masses. So I was like, you know that our culture is valuable, but to put our culture on the same tier as white norms. And, and I remember one time I presented this work, Oscar, and a student said, you know, in response to my professionalism argument that professionalism in, in most Western society is code for white. Everything from, quote unquote, starting things on time, getting to business first, wearing the gray suit, having the straight hair. Like there are so many components of professionalism that have just been normalized around a certain type of body, a certain type of voice. And the student pushed back, said, everyone knows what it means to be a professional in every part of the world. I was like, I bet you in this room alone, we have a million different definitions of what it means to be professional. Um, this is not something that we are born understanding. And, and I think of all the things we miss out on. And one of the things I've been challenging myself to do, both as a, a educator, so in my class, but also in my research and scholarship, is thinking about how much I've normalized white dominant norms and culture in every aspect of my work. How am I constructing my syllabus? How am I you know, approaching research questions? Am I assuming that there is some sort of de deficit or deficiency in marginalized groups in my investigating of their work experiences? And I've been really blessed to learn a lot from the indigenous scholars in our field who have started to release lots of publications in Journal of Management Education and American or uh, Academy of Management Learning and Education on how we can reapproach conversations around sustainability, for instance. I wonder so much if our larger corporate business culture had a more indigenous mindset about the earth and the world, we would approach profit margins and gains in such a different way. Thinking about wisdom as a foundational component of how we should be approaching our work, compassion, notions of unity and synergy amongst all living beings. Like We, we would approach how we think about the world and our function as, as business in society so differently if we had that as a normative cultural mindset into business operations. So I think we are, we as a society are missing out on keeping one group's norms and powers in place. It's quite bland, right? It's like, what? the gray suit is so boring. <laughs> and like having everyone quote unquote speak the same, it's, we are limiting ourselves as humans. And then I think about too, the quote unquote business case for having people bring more of themselves to work. I think it was Professor Sandra Cha and Laura Morgan Roberts, who, who's org science recently talked, the Organization Science Journal recently talked about this, where the more culturally authentic Black and Asian journalists felt that they could be, the better that their work quality. It actually enhances, you know, the work that we're doing, the lens that we can take if we're not feeling pressure to confine and normalize to this very narrow way of presenting ourselves. So that's that. I'm off my rant. <laughs> I'm done. No, no. Look, you are preaching to the right choir here. <laughs> so I totally co-sign with everything you just said. And 
getting back to code switching, one of the things I love about your research is that you use a lot of different methods. You use quantitative methods. You also use qualitative methods. And it's a lot of the qualitative methods, right, that you get a lot of the intrigue from the data, right? So talk to us about some of those stories, right? What are some of the most memorable code switching stories some of your participants have shared with you, as well as I'm going to ask you about some of yours, if you don't mind sharing some of your most memorable code switching stories with us. Absolutely. So my colleagues and I, we've primarily done this work with Black people living in America. And, and I frame it as that because we don't differentiate between people who are citizens of this country um, and want to make sure we're, we're talking about the Black experience in America just all together, including immigrant Black people and people who identify as Afro-Latino. So we're thinking about that group. Some of the ones that I remember, we had a lot of people in healthcare take our survey. Um, I think it's just how we were able to recruit participants. And hearing things like patients, whenever I'm going into a patient's room, this is coming from most physicians and nurses, the patient identifies as white. There's this feeling that I, as the physician, have to adjust my normal way of speaking and demeanor, even though I actually have authority in that room. I am the expert in the room, but there's this immediate power difference there. A lot of our Black women participants talked about the pressure associated with hair styling in particular. One of the ones that stood out to me when I saw this question posed was a Black woman who had scheduled a hair appointment prior to having a job interview, and the stylist had to reschedule, and she was so nervous and had so much anxiety and freaked out. She said, I just knew I wasn't going to get that job for no other reason, right? Like her credentials were fine. But she said, I knew if I didn't have a chance to get my hair done, that it didn't matter that they were going to automatically judge me as being unprofessional. And unfortunately, it's still legal in a lot of states in our country to fire people for having what's considered unprofessional and unkempt hair, which is code for Black and Afrocentric hairstyle features. The last one that came to mind for me, this is actually wasn't from a Black person, but we, we did some experiments where we asked both Black and white people to evaluate a code switching candidate, you know, in a job scenario. We created these fictional characters. They were either code switching or not. And they explicitly told this observer, this is how I code switch or this is how I do not code switch at work. One of the things that stood out to us from the white participants' responses was how much they did not understand why someone wouldn't code switch at work and why a Black person in particular wouldn't code switch. They said things like, nappy hair doesn't belong in the workplace. Of course, they should straighten their hair. Or that name is too difficult to pronounce. Of course, they should change it to something that's easier. That would just make the whole work environment easier for everyone else. And I was like, this is fascinating, like how much their own comfort and norms are spilling over into how they expect other people to behave. So those also stood out to me, not just, you know, in terms of the individual code switching in their stories, but also how it's being perceived and observed from others and this expectation that people should do it. Are you willing to share some of your personal stories with us? Sure. I'll start with one of my earliest ones. This is before I knew what the term code switching was, but it really draws on the socialization piece that I think a lot of Black children have in this country. I remember going to a doctor, dentist, uh, when I was probably four or five years old. And my mother, right outside the door, leaned over to my brother and I was like, okay, when we get in here, you cannot do this. You cannot be loud. You cannot be rowdy. You have to sit here quietly. And we're like, okay, we, you know, okay, we can't do anything. We go in there and we see these white children, like, throwing things, right? And they're, they're trying to grab the fish out the fish tank. And we're just looking around. And my mom was like, you can't act like that. That's a slightly unique form of code switching because she was basically telling us, you can't be a kid in this environment. You know, there's toys. I'm going to need you to sit right here with me because she knew that a Black child engaging in very similar behaviors to a white child was going to be perceived differently. And unfortunately, we see that play out a lot in society where the adultification of Black children uh, means that they're not allowed to be children and they have to adjust their, their self-presentation. That was one example. The other one, I always laugh about this one, pre-Zoom interviews, you know, when you were interviewing for a job, you usually do phone before in-person. So I remember doing a phone interview and I have been told most of my life that I sound like a white girl. I, I sound white. And I used to wonder, am I code switching or is this just my natural voice? So I do think I have adjusted 
type of terms I use. I used to feel pressure in academia to use the big word, like, oh, um, I have to say epistemology. And it's like, no one knows what that means. <laughs> right. say, it, say it with chest. Like, so I, I definitely throw in more sayings now in my speech. But I remember doing a phone interview. People were so excited. I get to the in-person interview and there's me and a white woman sitting there. And the receptionist, when it was time for uh, the interview, she came right up to me and she's like, Dominique, we're ready for you. And the white woman stood up. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, I'm Courtney Lynn. <laughs> and that was a moment where the white woman was expecting me to have the black sounding name. They heard my voice. They just knew that was Courtney Lynn, the, the, you know, the white girl. And it was, it was one of those moments where I was like, oh my gosh, I have like created this persona, this person who is not me. <laughs> it's like, it's not, it's not me. Definitely have, you know, the hairstyling stories, panicking before presentations if I can't get my hair done for that. And, and even in this new Zoom remote work environment, I remember talking with Dr. Laura Morgan Roberts. We wrote another HBR piece about working from home while Black. And one of the things that we both experienced early in the pandemic was the closure of salons and all of a sudden Zoom cameras, lighting. And I was terrified. This I had just transitioned into my current role. I just started there in July. First time meeting my colleagues and my hair. I was like, oh my God, it's not straightened yet. And, and part of, I think, my way of easing myself into new environments is to present myself as white as possible at first. Right. And then slowly over time, chip away at that and try to be my more authentic self. This pandemic was like, oh, well, you're going to be your blackest self on camera <laughs> right now. So I had to, I didn't have the ability to code switch anymore. And, and my colleagues and I actually collected data on this as well about 10 months into the pandemic, how not being able to code switch, not being able to hide your, your black home life. How is that affecting your relationship with your colleagues? And we find a very similar pattern as we did before that people are still trying to figure out ways to code switch, turning off their camera, blurring their background, opting as much as possible to, to have phone meetings, wanting to continue to create that distance, but not being able to code switch is also stressful, which I thought was so fascinating. It's like code switching long-term has huge consequences for our health and well-being. In the short term, we still panic when we don't have that tool available to us. The healthcare setting that you mentioned made me think of this example. And I want to think about co-switching from a white perspective as well, right? So I'm going to share a personal example. And <laughs> hopefully people are okay with this personal example. So I remember when I, one of my first times when I moved to Tuscaloosa to you know, finished my PhD at the University of Alabama, I had to go to the doctor, to the student clinic for, you know, I can't even remember what was wrong, but I was in the exam room and one of the nurses said to me something like, oh, are you fixing or finning to do something? Mm. And I remember because of course I've heard that phrase before, but I personally never used it that often. Like, I don't think I've used it much, you know, growing up at all. But I was like, wait a minute. <laughs> you know, it made me think, like, why is she using that type of language with me? You know, is this just, you know, we're in the deep south. Like, you know, it's a, it's a really southern phrase as well. And I'm from Virginia, so I'm, you know, could consider myself southern as well. You know, I consider what I am southern. <laughs> but but it was, was not a phrase that I used or, like, really grew up hearing a lot. It made me think about code switching again at that moment it was like, you know, is this her authentic communication, right? Does she speak like this just with patience? Or was it because I'm a black man? She perhaps tried to, you know, she may have made an assumption that she would be more familiar with me uh, to make me feel more comfortable or whatever if she speak in a different type of way. What are your thoughts about that? Because it really bothered me, right? Because <laughs> I'm like, I'm in a professional study. Like, what are you talking to yes. me? <laughs> so many thoughts are coming to mind for me, Oscar. Like, I'm, I'm thinking of the term Black scent that I heard across various non-Black communities, not just white people, but, you know, Aquafina, the Asian actress, is one of the main public figures that people have been talking about with this Black scent that people will put on when they want to sound more cool or when they're interacting with Black people. And so that came to mind for me. Like, there is this, I see a Black person and I presume I have to change my style of speech in order to relate to them better. It also makes me think about, I think this was Dr. Ivy's Amador's work, 
where it may not be hard. I'll have to like verify this, where white liberals, people who identified as, as liberal and white would feel that they would have to talk down to their black colleagues or, or they presume that the level at which they are speaking or engaging has to be dumbed down for black people. I think about moments where I see a white woman, they're like, hey, girl, I'm like, <laughs> I'm like why are you putting on this right. And I usually say like, hello. <laughs> like, first of all, we're not that close. Right. I think this is also behavioral manifestation of the racial anxiety that white people feel when they're interacting with black people and other people of color. I think it's a, I think it's a weird, like, like I said, there is this sense of, I'm not just trying to build a relationship with you, but I think I already have a relationship with you. This may come historically from people in positions of power being able to have access to and control over other people. And so as I think about, you know, historically enslaved people, their enslavers treated them like objects, like toys. Like I can play with you. I can like say, hey girl, and touch your hair because historically that was always available to them. That might be a stretch, but I do think the Black scent is part of that racial anxiety manifesting. Like, oh, in order for me to demonstrate that I am down with the cause, I have to, you know, become racial doll right? <laughs> become a Black person in order to empathize um, or to feel like you can, quote unquote, speak their lingo. Um, I also think Black cultural norms, how they speak, has been conflated with coolness. Anything that's considered innovative or hip. I think about Black terms being used in white spaces in all the wrong ways. I, there was this great piece about cancel culture moving from a Black thing like Actually, the first time I heard cancel was in New Jack City when West Side's character, Nino Brown, he poured drink on his girlfriend at the time. I was like, cancel that. <laughs> so that was the first time I ever heard it. And and then, yeah, it's like seeing terms get picked up by white culture and then being weaponized against marginalized groups like cancel. Like, oh, people are so sensitive. They want to cancel us. I'm like, that's not what that means. It's really hard as a person in power and as a whole organization to be canceled. Like you're still making revenue. You're still worth millions. You're actually not being canceled. You're just being held accountable. But, you know, accountability when you're used to inequality feels like oppression for people who are in positions of power to be held accountable or to be considered on the same plane as other people. That's my long-winded way of saying I do think Black scent emerges very strongly. And unfortunately, I don't just see this with white people. I see people's behavior switch when a Black person comes into the room. Their tone will change. Like, oh, what's up, girl? I'm like, dude, right. why are you <laughs> Right. Even if you get to all black space, you will see multiple manners of greeting because we're also not a model. Right? Exactly. It's like some of us say hello, some of us say what up, some of us not. Right? It's not a universal thing. <laughs> Speaking of that, thank you. I feel better about how I felt about the moment at that time with that explanation. But also, you know, I think one of the examples that come to mind was the famous Obama bump, you know, to not only to, to Michelle Obama, but when he was like greeting the different players and, and things and like handshake here, fist bump that. and then of course, you know, the key to did like a comedy sketch about yeah. it. <laughs> That's my favorite example of going to three. That's my favorite. The Kim Peele sketch is brilliant. <laughs> We talked about code switching. We talked about the cost. You know, it's not always bad, right? So code switching is not necessarily always bad or lead to negative outcomes, as you mentioned before. So, you know, help our listeners kind of understand the differences between positive and negative code switching. One of the ones that come to my mind is I have the most difficulty with code switching is with talking to media. Because as an academic, right, like we need to code switch when we talk to media. And it's like so difficult for me because they like they they have their formula and it's so hard for me, right, to just get that formula down. And I leave an interview and I'm like, I'm so exhausted. That was so much goals, which I had to do. Yes. I love that. I love that you framed this question, Oscar. It makes me think of a couple of things. Like so of course, you know, negatively, it's things like feeling that your own culture is not valued in this particular space that you're in. So you have to change it. I think about this in educational context where if schools lack a culturally competent, not just culturally competent, but culturally celebratory curriculum, it's basically telling like a lot of black and brown children that your way of being, speaking, existing is not valued. And, and I think that also spills over to the workplace. So of course, those are the negative 
aspects of code switching. It's, it's just this constant denial of yourself in order to be this, this person that society wants you to be. But the positives, as you mentioned, it helps with translating information across contexts. One of the positives of code switching that I learned from Dr. Paula Caliguri of Northeastern University is it also prepares people to be culturally adaptable and agile. And as I think about our you know, world of work becoming more globalized, having people with cultural agility, someone who's able to adapt to multiple situations and actually build relationships with people across different regions of the world and cultural groups or even different industries as we're trying to be more innovative as a society and think about how we can take on some grand challenges by building alliances and partnerships across sectors and across fields, having culturally agile people, people who have practiced and learned code switching and being able to channel that towards this new globalized initiative, I think is a brilliant way for individuals to retranslate and repurpose their code switching skills from merely survival and denial of your cultural identity to actually being more adaptive to different, you know, unique situations and settings. So that's one of the things I've been encouraging workplaces to think about. It's like, think about not only how much your black and brown employees have performed, but also that they were carrying this burden of adjusting how they speak and how they present themselves while performing. These are some amazingly agile and adaptive people. They should be put into more expat positions. We should see way more black and brown people being expatriates for a lot of these companies going into different cultures and, and regions of the world and starting to build these relationships because we've been doing it our whole lives here in America, right? Um, and not just America, but like wherever situation where we find ourselves underrepresented and in low positions of power. You just read my mind because as soon as you said that, I was thinking about Dr. Berto Bell's research on biculturalism and how Black people tend to be more successful as expatriates because we've always had to live in so many different worlds, right? So you were just reading my mind there. So you talked a little bit about some of the research that you're doing now. I want you to kind of share a little bit more about some projects that we can look out for coming from you. Because then I want to go back to just talking about this pandemic and this racial reckoning moment. And I think it's, you know, more appropriate to end on that. Get your new stuff out. There. What are you working on now first? And then we'll come back to just talk about because we've had a week. And so I would want to end with that and give some space to talk about that. Yeah. And do you mean like my work as it relates to code switching or just broadly? Broadly speaking, yeah. Anything you're working on, we want to make sure we look out for you. Thank you. So one of my current uh, large ongoing projects is situated in Detroit, Michigan. And I started this project back in 2018, trying to understand how a very diverse setting, a place that has majority Black people and, and other people of color, in what ways are organizations aware and operating with the knowledge that they are existing in a predominantly Black space? Or are they defaulting to the norms, the practices, the ways of operating that still normalizes whiteness and white culture, norms, and people? Um, so I'm exploring this within Detroit's entrepreneurial ecosystem. I, I've done a couple of interviews about this with Market Watch on NPR, and I have an MIT Sloan Management Review that sort of summarizes the data we've collected thus far. So that's currently in the works. and got an R&R in &R your journal, which is great. And I'm so excited to point out the various ways that organizations are consciously or unconsciously, again, normalizing whiteness, even when a lot of white people don't exist. So this notion that we just need to diversify our workplaces is not enough. We actually have to think about the culture, the norm, and the practices we put in place. So that's one of my areas of work that's ongoing and forward thinking. I also, along with my code switching collaborators, have started to collect data on this new remote work environment and how code switching is manifesting there when our home life has now become an object for public gaze and in what ways can that reinforce stereotypes and unfortunately create negative evaluations and perceptions of a lot of black and brown people in this country. Another area of work that I'm, I'm sort of just now getting started is percolating in my mind is with black scientists. One of the things that this pandemic especially made us think about was all the various, not just health disparities, but why there is so much distrust of scientific and government communities when it comes to Black people. We have not had a very positive history associated with healthcare institutions in particular. So I started with one of my colleagues 
exploring and, and asking questions of Black people who are in scientific roles and government roles and how and to what extent do they think about their racial identity as it pertains to this knowledge work sector that they're doing. And that has been a super interesting body of work. We're going to submit it to some conferences this fall and, and see what comes of that. So I'm, I'm excited about this new area of research as well. I'm so excited to hear the presentations that you give as well as to read when they are out in print. So as we close this episode, I want to give space to the moment we've had a week where we've gotten the results of the Derek Chauvin trial, who was found guilty, which was a shock to many of us, to be honest, because we've we've seen this play out so many times where people murder innocent people and they were found not guilty. But then we also had, you know, the, the shooting on the same day, right? Like it was just hours apart of uh, Makia Bryant. Talk to us about what this means to you in this moment and um, how are you coping? And if you can just give us some advice to the listeners of productive ways of coping through this moment. We have a saying, you know, calling in black, right? <laughs> that we use a lot when these moments happen uh, because it's like, we recognize we need a day, like we need a day. What are your thoughts? So this notion of calling in black, my colleagues and I actually wrote a paper about this in 2017. When we were all graduate students at the time, that week in 2016, where Philando Castile and Alton Sterling were murdered within 24 hours of each other, and then the Dallas police shooting with the sniper there, there was, we all realized we were experiencing some sort of vicarious trauma through, through the witness of this. And so now this is going on for years, five years since then. And, you know, as a graduate student, coping meant a lot of unhealthy <laughs> behaviors, but this was my first time teaching as a faculty member. And teaching this past semester has been so difficult on so many levels. And I have never before experienced and felt like I was being asked from my students and from administrators to help people cope with various levels of grief. We had the, you know, I have several Asian women in my class and who are my colleagues. And that day where these Asian women were murdered in Atlanta, where there's ongoing violence affecting Asian people, where there are still children in cages. Uh, who identify as Latino and the shooting death of a 13-year-old Latino child. And, and then adding that onto this week of, you know, Black people holding their breath of not whether or not this person will be go to jail, but what does this even mean in terms of how Black life is valued? Because I, I'm a teacher now and, and have been in front of students during all this time, I think one of the ways that I've learned how to cope was to thinking about how to create space for them. And really trying to embody a lot of the principles we put in that calling in black paper, canceling assignments, creating class periods where we don't worry about the lesson and where we just sit and process grief and allowing myself to be vulnerable and transparent with them. That has been such a healing experience as opposed to it's actually really the code switching, trying to obscure how I actually feel at the moment. I think that is a default response that we quote unquote, don't cry in front of your students. You don't cry in front of your colleagues. And I threw all of that out the window this semester, it was like nearly impossible to not experience grief. And then we've had our own personal issues on campus where a Black male student was found dead in one of the dorm rooms. And, and this is added on to, again, all the ongoing uh, trauma that exists here. So we have had lots of support from our university and institution, grief counselors, lots of support for people to engage in physical activity. I personally think that that's one of the ways that I cope as I work out with that, I actually just came from a workout before this. Uh, it's just one of the ways that I, I tried to think through stress and just giving myself more grace and time. I've never thought it was professional to ask for extension, for instance, on what I have a deadline to do. Now I'm realizing, you know what, this is way more human for me. And, and I teach a lot of human resource master's level students. And I was like, let's talk about the human part of HR practices. And the human part needs an extension because I'm grieving today. The human part needs more compassionate policies that allow people to not just call in Black, but to normalize days where we are not feeling that we have to be productive all the time and normalizing grief, you know, with your colleagues, with your fellow classmates. And, and that has been such a profound shift in what I previously thought it meant to be a professor, what it meant to be in front of your classroom. You don't show you know, emotion. And now it's like, no, 
how could I not do this right. without showing them? So thank you so much for that, Courtney. Thank you for joining me in the guest chair today. You've given us so much good advice and it will help a lot of people, a lot of our listeners. Um, you know, code switching is, is amazingly complex and you just broke down a lot for us. So I really appreciate you for that. I wish you well at Cornell and with all of your future endeavors. Thank you so much for having me. And and I will say as a closing, code switching is not something that I would say you do or you don't. I, I've never wanted to be in that position, tell someone what they should or should not do. But figuring out how to leverage it strategically as we move forward in our careers and in life, that is the advice that I would hope to leave with your listeners. So thank you again for having me. My pleasure. Thank you for listening to Diversity Matters. If you enjoyed our show and want to hear more, please subscribe to our show, post, talk about, and reshare our show with all of your friends and family. And leave us a favorable review and rating so that it will make it easier for others to find us wherever they listen to podcasts. We cannot do this important work or keep it going without you. So we really appreciate your support. We especially like to thank our episode sponsor, The PhD Project. Please support their mission by donating to The PhD Project. And if you're interested in a PhD in business, you can find more information on their website by visiting www.phdproject.org. If you or your company would like to sponsor a Diversity Matters episode, please visit the podcast section of our website at www.whconsultingfirm.com for more information. Diversity Matters is produced by WH Consulting, a firm that provides a wide range of management consulting and professional services to individuals and organizations. Original music produced by Sincere Morton Mary. Until next time, peace and love. Thank you.